Hello. Our story begins on the fall. Ahsoka is in the middle of an empty field, walking around, as she stood over the emptiness of what used to be the Jedi Temple of Lothal. The former Emperor destroyed it, ripping it out of the ground and placing it inside of Thrawn's flagship, the Chimera. That is, until Ezra Bridger bravely destroyed it. He was faced with the decision to have his parents back or his friends, and he chose his friends before sending himself and Thrawn into deep space, far away from Lothal, thus saving it from the clutches of the Empire. It had been nearly two decades since he was taken away, but it was alright. Ahsoka and her friends and the Ghost crew, after defeating the Empire, found Ezra. They brought him back to the Land of the Living, but alongside of him, they brought back an heir to the Empire. Thrawn had been sitting in deep space, and when he returned, he learned that his Emperor had been apparently killed in the second Death Star over Endor. Thrawn couldn't believe they would build a second one if the first one failed. Regardless, Thrawn learned of several Imperial factions that were fighting with each other, and he returned to them. For Ahsoka, after she and her friends saved Ezra, returned to the Thal so that she could find some peace. The galaxy had changed greatly since the Empire fell, and the Chosen One brought balance to the Force. The Empire fell and the New Republic had picked up, and from Coruscant they relocated to the Hazian system, which was inside the Biblio sector in the colony's region of the galaxy. The reason for this relocation is because the core had been under Republic control for nearly a decade, but there were bits of infighting with small Imperial remnants and the New Republic inside the colony's region of the galaxy. The New Republic believed setting up in the colonies would force the Imperial remnant from the galaxy, and initially it did. It was a sound decision made by the New Republic, and while people inside the core, especially Coruscant, were rather outraged, there was actually finally a sense of peace on the planet. They had been crippled by Imperial rule for nearly three decades, and without galactic leadership presiding over them, it gave them a sense of relief, as odd as that might sound. It was the first time Coruscant hadn't been the capital of the galaxy for over millennia, and it was just a nice change for the residents. The force itself was incredibly different. The Force returned to balance by Anakin Skywalker when he defeated Darth Sidious and Darth Vader, the two most powerful avatars of the dark side ever seen in galactic history. Without the Sith, the return to balance could begin, with Luke, Leia, and Ahsoka representing such balance in the Force, the Force itself was able to actually heal. This didn't mean that there wasn't evil in the galaxy. There were still accolades of the dark side, many of which challenged Ahsoka in her trials to save and find Ezra Bridger. However, these dark side users didn't challenge the Force itself, nor did they upset the cosmic balance, because of the distinct difference between these acolytes and the incredible avatars of the Force. Palpatine and Vader offset the cosmic balance because they were so powerful. Luke and Leia had the same effect on the Force, being born of the most powerful being the galaxy had ever seen. And while the general consensus was that Palpatine was gone, he hadn't actually died. Though, his effect on the Force was less than one of these dark side acolytes that we mentioned before. He lost so much power when he died, and as a direct result of him barely surviving, he was able to be held together by machines that weren't even ready for him. His presence in the Force was the equivalent to that of a parasite, not large enough to even be an itch in the Force. With Palpatine being so separated from the Force, the Skywalker twins were able to step forward into the Force as the new power inside of it. Luke and Leia initially trained with each other, Leia donning a beautiful lightsaber that resembled that of the first Jedi she ever encountered. Even more than that, her son donned the name of the tired old man who saved her from the clutches of the Empire when she was just a child. Though Leia stopped her training when she believed it'd be better for her son if she stopped. It was her final night of training and she had a vision of her son. Ben dying because of her, and she couldn't live with that, so she left the Jedi. For Luke, this was relatively hard, having lost two students that were originally meant to be his original students. For Luke, he saw this as a reason to focus more on the code and ethics of the Jedi Order, and to follow the older texts left behind by the archivists from the Purge of 19 BBY. Luke was relieved when he learned that Han and Leia were permitting Ben Solo to become Luke's very first student in his Jedi Academy on Osis, which was located very far away from Han and Leia, who raised Ben on Chandrilla inside of the core. Osis was inside of the Adagetta system, inside of the Ural sector of the Outer Rim territories. It was far away from where Ahsoka was too. Lothal was in the northeast region of the Outer Rim, bordering the Calamari sector where Mon Cala was. 
Ahsoka was here because she believed she needed to be here. She always trusted the Force, and the Force was guiding her to this location. For her, she had to find out why that was the case. She came to this temple because the Force was strong here. Lothal was a very unique planet in the galaxy, one very strong with the Force, one that was interconnected to everything, and one strong with the animals that were binded to this planet. The world between worlds, the ones, animals of the Force, and so much more were here on Lothal. And so Ahsoka knelt down in the indented circles where the Jedi Temple used to be. She closed her eyes and focused on the living Force around her. She was so brilliantly connected to the Force, there were few others like Ahsoka in the history of the galaxy. During the Old Republic, there were a couple Jedi Jedi Masters who wielded white lightsabers, and during the era of the High Republic, there were two recorded Jedi who had white lightsabers as well, Umbaran Jedi Master Orla Jarni and Togruta Jedi Master Dora Mali. While there were other cases of white lightsabers, they weren't particularly well documented. Ahsoka through the Force purged her lightsaber crystals of what she took from the Sixth Brother of their darkness, ridding the crimson glow for a pure glow. Ahsoka was shortly after closing her eyes transported into another world. She didn't know where she was or why she was here, though she watched as the new capital of the Republic crumbled. Not just through sheer force of corruption or greed, the entire planets were upended. This was far worse than the power of the Death Star, of which was exhibited on Alderaan, Jeddah, and Scarif. This was a super weapon large enough to wipe out an entire star system. It terrified Ahsoka. She was transported elsewhere as she saw a masked man on the bridge of a new star destroyer. His demand presence reminded her of Thrawn, yet there was something off about him. Ahsoka was transported to Ossus, where she saw a Jedi Temple burning in the death of so many students surrounding a Jedi Master, whose heart was broken. Before the end of everything, she saw a small child on a forested world, and after the child, she heard the sound of a voice so familiar yet so distant. The voice couldn't be identified and neither could the words being said by the voice. Ahsoka's vision ended and when she woke up she was laying on the ground looking up at the stars. It was clear that the day had passed while she was meditating. Ahsoka knew she had to warn the New Republic, being that Mon Cala was so close to Lothal, she was going to head over there and see if she could get a hold of Admiral Akbar or any of the other former Alliance generals or admirals and see if she could help. Ahsoka latched onto the thought of Thrawn, being that it felt like she was dealing with a Thrawn project, a massive super weapon that could wipe out entire star systems with the pull of a lever. It was a brilliantly concocted vile weapon that only a tactical genius and wild lover of the Empire could do. Sure, Ahsoka was possibly misinterpreting Thrawn, and her vision as a whole, but she allowed panic to get the best of her in this moment and made her act kind of irrationally. Ahsoka's first move got her into the vessel and flying towards Mon Cala. Though with a vision so dense and so built on terror, it was hard to not see why this would misconstrue her thoughts. She had just watched the most evil regime in galactic history fall and the last thing she wanted to imagine was trillions of lives lost within a manner of seconds to another super weapon. Ahsoka was well aware that the New Republic had been demilitarizing since around 9 ABY. They had New Republic cruisers and they used them on the ever so hard to find Imperial Remnant, but most of the Alliance vessels were being decommissioned. The New Republic, led by Mon Mothma as a new Chancellor, worked hard towards demilitarizing her entire Alliance fleet. There was a reason for this. She believed that the Empire ruled with fear, which it did. Mothma wanted the New Republic to be a symbol of peace, though demilitarizing so quickly could possibly have ramifications. Though Mothma had individuals she trusted from the era of the Alliance working hard to bring an end to the Imperial Remnant, especially since Thrawn's return sent ripples throughout the galaxy. On Ossus, Luke Skywalker and Ezra Bridger were talking about the new Jedi Order. Ezra had input, but he knew that the Order belonged to Luke. He just wanted to help. Luke did offer Ezra a chance to be a part of the new Jedi Order as a master, but Ezra wasn't too sure just yet. He believed he had a purpose to do more in the galaxy. Luke and Ezra were the same age, though Ezra only being a single day older than both Luke and Leia. Ezra told Luke about his master Kanan Jarrus, explaining that Kanan helped him get through his struggles when he was stuck with Thrawn for so long. If he didn't have his master's teachings, he wouldn't have made it. But Ezra also had a gift for Luke. Originally, Ezra didn't want to get rid of it, but he had a data card that carried all the information on Kanan's holocron, the information showing Anakin Skywalker teaching Ahsoka on how to use a lightsaber. It was a simple form instruction video, but for Luke, it was one more thing that kept him close to his father, and it was also great for R2 considering he helped Anakin record those videos that were saved in the little data disc. 
Luke was very thankful for Ezra's visit and told him that he was always welcome home here at the Jedi Academy. Ahsoka arrived outside of Mon Cala and got permission to board one of the MC-70s that hadn't been retired yet. On board was a descent of Admiral Radis. Currently, Radis' son was overseeing the production of a new cruiser for the Republic fleet, which was going to be named after his father. It was a true gift, but regardless, he was curious as to why Ahsoka was here. She had come to tell them that the threat of Thrawn was much larger than anyone initially thought. They needed to push out into the unknown regions to find Thrawn, to stop him before he did something terrible. Though under New Republic protocol, they couldn't just do that. This wasn't the era of the Alliance where anybody could just bite at the Empire if they wanted. They had to be consolidated in their effort against the evil powers, and it had to be approved by the Senate. Mon Mothma was trying very hard to keep this Republic from failing. While it sounded like a terrible idea to make everything be passed through the Senate, there was actually a good reason for Mon Mothma forcing military personnel to be approved by the Senate. It's because in the days after the Empire fell, a group of rebel insurgents went off a limb and they attacked a popular imperial province. The rebels bombed and killed several civilians who supported the Empire. This attack left a terrible taste in the mouths of those who were now under the control of the New Republic. It was the opposite of the message that Mon Mothma was trying to push, and so she shut it down before it could go any further, as such behavior was imperial to say the least. Ahsoka was disappointed, but the truth is, there was nothing she could realistically do about it. The Alliance was no longer a thing, and this was no longer rebellion. It was a form of government that needed to control all of its assets because any move could be seen as hostile or even oppressive, and the New Republic couldn't afford another war. Five years after Ahsoka's initial vision, the galaxy hadn't changed much, though that was from the eyes of someone who didn't sit in the Senate. The New Republic had been lying to the galaxy for the last six years. Chancellor Mon Mothma and the Republic had been fighting insurgents such as Moff Gideon and Grand Admiral Thrawn, since Gideon was taken from the New Republic and since Thrawn returned. The New Republic just suffered its worst loss since the Age of Rebellion, though the battle itself cost the Empire Moff Gideon, which for the Remnant was a blessing, being that Gideon and Thrawn didn't exactly see eye to eye. Thrawn was part of a larger picture, one that included the Emperor and a good ally of his in general pride. Throughout the past five years, Ahsoka had been having constant visions and they led her to a planet in the Outer Rim territories called Hypercarn. This was an unestablished planet, but for whatever reason the Force was calling her to this location. While Ahsoka landed, she thought that she might be bringing another student to Luke, which would be great. Luke's academy was flourishing. Shortly after Ezra Bridger left five years before, Ben Solo was welcomed into the academy as one of the first students. In the five years since, Luke's academy held a dozen students, all trained by Skywalker himself. Ben was by far the most impressive student of the bunch, but he was a Skywalker. Luke had collected several artifacts leading up to his first student, such as eight original Jedi texts a Jedi Crusader pendant, and a multitude of holocrons. Regardless, Ahsoka found herself on the planet of Hypercarn, luring herself towards this distress in the forest. She walked through the forest of this beautiful planet. Ahsoka looked up and around, taking in the absolute beauty of everything present on this planet. There were numerous birds speeding away. Ahsoka walked up to a small house, made out of logs of the planet. It wasn't large, but it was sustainable for two people. Ahsoka walked up and knocked on the door. The door was answered, but something felt very off by the way the door opened and the way the woman opened it. She looked terrified. Ahsoka asked what was wrong. The woman told Ahsoka that they were on the run from her husband's father. Ahsoka apologized for them being on the run, but she was... She paused, and then continued suggesting that she was a Jedi. She was looking for a child. The parents both stopped what they were doing. Dathan and Mimrar were trying to get their child to safety before the Sith got to them. If this was truly a Jedi, then their daughter could be saved. Ahsoka asked who the Sith was. As to Ahsoka's understanding, the Sith had been gone since Palpatine's death. The son turned slowly towards Ahsoka with fear in his eyes. He told Ahsoka that his father was still alive. Ahsoka's heart fell into her stomach as she looked down at the five-year-old girl. A million thoughts ran through her mind, and even in this instant, Ahsoka thought that maybe she should kill the girl. She didn't know why, though. Dathan told Ahsoka that if she was a Jedi, she needed to get out of here with their daughter. Ahsoka stopped him and asked him, how at all it was possible for Palpatine never turned. Dathan looked up, a million memories coursing through his mind as he told Ahsoka that Sidious never died. He lost all of his power when the Chosen One brought balance to the Force. 
Nathan continued, calling Palpatine father, saying that he has survived and has been hooked up to rudimentary technology that had been keeping him alive and sustained for the last several years. Palpatine used a force to make Dathan, and Dathan didn't show any of the talent that Palpatine wanted from a child, and so he banished him. Palpatine sent him off Exegol in hopes that Dathan would have a child and that child would be as attuned as he is. And only just a day ago, Rey started to exhibit signs of her grandfather. Palpatine would be coming for her. Ahsoka didn't know how to conceptualize it. As Dathan grabbed Ahsoka's shoulder with a shallow breath in his lungs, he told her that Palpatine was building something so large, so incredible, that it could bring the galaxy to its knees. Ahsoka tried to understand why he wouldn't tell anybody, but how could he? He was a nobody, who was related to the most evil man the galaxy had ever seen, spouting off about how his apparent dead father was coming back from the dead to wipe out the galaxy to take power for himself and restore what he was calling the Final Order. Ethan's voice cracked as he asked Ahsoka where she thought all the former Imperial officers were going. They weren't going to Coruscant or to prison, they were going to Exegol to build his final order. Mimora grabbed Rey and handed the child to Ahsoka, and told her that Rey needed to be trained as a Jedi. If not, then she would succumb to the same curse that corrupted her very own grandfather. Ahsoka looked down at the child, and then back up at the parents. They told Ahsoka that they never expected this day to come. Five years without showing any trait to use a force, and they thought they were safe, but that was far from the truth now. Their daughter had the same potential as an evil grandfather who brought the galaxy to his knees originally, and she too could do the same if he got a hold of her. The two slammed the door on Ahsoka, who was full of shock. Ahsoka turned with the child and ran to the ship. There was an issue, she couldn't go to Usus with Luke. The only reason being is that if the Emperor was able to try and find Rey, then leading him and his forces to Usus was the worst possible thing that she could do for the Jedi. Across the galaxy, Palpatine sat suspended from an electrical circuit that was keeping him alive. Barely. Palpatine was a ghost, hanging on by a thread, but he could feel it. He felt the moment that Rey used a force. The two of them were inextricably connected. But feeling, that is all he could do. Anything more would kill him. Not like he could do anything more than feel anyways. Palpatine felt like a helpless child, which royally upset him because never in his life was he helpless. Sure, he grew up in a galaxy with the same amount of light as Luke and Leia admitted, but he could change that, and he did. Nowadays, he couldn't do anything but suffer in the brightness. Ahsoka took Rey to a planet far from Luke, and a planet that she thought would originally be safe for them, Tython. It wasn't on any maps for the galaxy because in the days since the Republic fell, there was no need to know about it. With the Empire rising, it wiped them off the map, once Palpatine and his goons stormed the temple, took everything they wanted, and blew the rest of it to hell. It would be safer than now. When Ahsoka got there, she sent a communication to Luke about Palpatine being alive. The tragedy is, Luke knew. He knew the moment that celebration ended on Endor. But it wasn't because he could feel it. It was because Luke never slept the same after Endor. What happened on the second Death Star haunted him to his very core, and just about every night he had nightmares about Sidious, and sometimes even Vader. Those nightmares forced Luke to struggle sometimes because they were overwhelming. Sometimes these nightmares would turn into sleep paralyses of sorts. Sometimes Luke would see Palpatine at the edge of his bed laughing at him, before disappearing. So. Luke did what was reasonable. He brought Ezra Bridger to his temple, and requested he continue the training of his students until he and Landa returned from their journey to Exegol. Ahsoka sent the two on a trail to Hypercon, where Ahsoka originally found Rey. When the two of them got there, they found Ochi, freshly after carving out Dathan and Marmarar with a Sith dagger. Luke and Lando were quickly to react, but someone like Ochi was much more talented than even they realized. Ochi had been hunting Jedi since the days of the Clone Wars, and he survived and encountered Jedi like Mace Windu and Depa Balaba, two incredibly well-trained and talented Jedi Masters of that era. Ochi was not going to go down easily, even against the likes of a talented Master of the Force like Luke Skywalker and a marksman shooter like Lando Calrissian. Ochi gave it his best, but after a short minute of him surprising Luke and Lando, they got their hands on the Sith Dagger after killing him. The Dagger led them on a chase to Endor, where Luke discovered a Sith Wifinder, and from there, he and Lando split up. Luke arrived on Exegol, where he would find the one who caused his father so much pain, and the one who had plagued Luke's mind for the last 16 years, a helpless, defenseless Emperor. Though, Luke knew killing him in anger would only be against the ways of the Jedi, and so, he simply unplugged the machine that was keeping him alive. And with that, the Emperor was dead. Luke spent the rest of his time on Exegol destroying the labs and forcing the workers to leave. Though Luke was distraught when he found that the final order was stationed here. The ships seemed like they were empty, with no one working on them. But that was far from the truth. All the ships here on Exegol were filled to the brim with crews. 
Luke got the coordinates and then used the tracker to track his movements before leaving. Luke planned on exposing the entire Final Order, to which he did, revealing the fleet to his sister, who informed the New Republic, and in one movement, the New Republic swooped into Exegol and destroyed the Final Order. Everything finally seemed right with the galaxy. It felt like and it looked like the galaxy could finally heal. Ahsoka was relieved when she learned that Luke killed the Emperor, but now came the tall task of training his granddaughter. Luke told Ahsoka that she could bring Rey to Osis so that she could be trained, but Ahsoka denied it. For the multiple weeks that Luke was away from his order, a new chain of events were set into motion. Ahsoka felt a strong connection to Rey, and so she decided that she would carry out the training of the young girl herself. Luke had no issue with it, and so he returned to his order to continue training. Ezra returned back into the galaxy, and all seemed right with everything. Training for Rey would be challenging for Ahsoka, not because Rey was a descendant of the most powerful Sith in the history of the galaxy, but because Ahsoka never taught. She was wise, incredibly gifted, and she guided many during her time, but teaching was something else. She never had taught before. Guiding Ezra and Kanan was so much different. It was helping them along the road, but not fully training them. Ahsoka tried to start somewhere, but it was a bit terrifying. She felt like Obi-Wan, both being so gifted themselves, yet under their guidance was a being with so much more potential than they could ever hope to reach. Sure, Rey didn't have the same mech's potential as Anakin, but that didn't make her any less of a challenge to Ahsoka. Because the accidental exposure to the Force developed really quickly under an experimented Force user. Though just because it developed didn't mean it was positive. It also didn't mean it was bad. It was just slightly terrifying. Rey was just a child and yet there was such a draw to the dark side within her. It wasn't her fault, but at the same time, it was scary. Luke had a similar experience. Ever since his return from Exegol, he noticed that Ben Solo was going towards the dark side. Not a lot, but just a glimpse here and there. Luke didn't panic at all, but it was a bit unnerving to say the very least. It was different. With Vader, he was dealing with an evil creature forged in darkness. He couldn't push Vader any further into the darkness, he could only save Anakin from Vader. With Ben, it was different. He didn't want to push his nephew into the darkness. He saw what that could become, so he decided to approach this delicately. By using what he saw Ben do and instruct his students as a whole about avoiding the use of the dark side. Though the issue is, Ben Solo was a bit corrupt by his own growth in the Force. The boy was just like his grandfather. There was so much Solo in him too, which only made things worse ironically. Ben had a bit of an ego and he pumped it because he was a grandson of the Chosen One. He wasn't overzealous with it, but it was noticeable. Regardless, Ahsoka and Rey were rough around the edges. It was all about finding your balance with a student. For Ahsoka, she found that balance through rocks. It was as simple as lifting rocks. When Ahsoka got Rey to lift rocks with her, the two of them were able to communicate through the Force. A lot of instruction between Rey and Ahsoka was non-verbal. It was the best way for her to learn. And even one-on-one -on -one with a teacher who wanted to teach her, she was very individualized. Rey loved Ahsoka and didn't want to be anywhere else than with her, especially after getting over the losing her parents thing. Rey idolized Ahsoka and is part of why their bond works so well. Ahsoka didn't overstep her boundaries, and she found a safe space to work with Rey in. Teachings typically revolved around the Force and how Ahsoka viewed it, which was vastly different than the view of the Jedi. Ahsoka was turning Rey into her mini-me. It was adorable. Rey would hang on Ahsoka's shoulders and on her back, and they would go through the forest on escapades. Of course, as Rey got older, she had to carry her own bag, and she would run on her own two feet, but that was just a luxury of being a child. For eight years, it seemed like the galaxy righted all the wrongs of the past, expelling the final order, the death of Palpatine, and what seemed to be the death of darkness. But on the eighth year, it would all change. Ben Solo one night would kill everyone inside of the temple. It wasn't Luke's fault. It was a power still left in the galaxy, though not one that belonged to Palpatine, and it was not a Sith. Ben had been corrupted, and it was just tying into his obsession with his grandfather. Luke didn't want to restrict his nephew from liking Anakin, but he often tried to express that while Anakin Skywalker was a good man, he made his mistakes, as all Jedi do. Luke's struggle with Ben was when to say no. The Jedi before him struggle was when to stop saying no. With the Jedi of the former Republic, they forced Anakin into a little bubble until he broke out and became Darth Vader. Luke didn't want that same fate for his grandson, and so he let little slip-ups get away, because he understood. Being the one who nearly bit his father to death on the second Death Star while using his Skywalker rage, he understood. It was a mistake though. Luke truthfully made a mistake, and it was a culture shock. He was immortalized within the galaxy. He was a legend for defeating Vader and Sidious, and four years before that, destroying the Death Star. He could do no wrong in the eyes of the public, and while Luke didn't believe that, he made a mistake. 
One night, he went into his nephew's hut and peered into his mind using the Force. There was something else in the galaxy, and it wasn't Palpatine, but similarly to the vision that Ahsoka had, he saw the Hosnian system destroyed. He watched his friend get killed in Han Solo. He saw people suffering at the end of all of that. He was looking into Vader's mask. Luke instinctually ignited his lightsaber, and then his heart fell into his stomach. He looked at Ben as he tried to explain what happened, but Ben saw this as nothing less than a visceral betrayal, crushing the support beam of the hut and then dragging the ceiling down onto Luke and escaping to the night after killing most of the Jedi Temple. Luke was ashamed. He felt the same pain that Yoda felt when he saw what happened when his best student destroyed his temple. Ahsoka a galaxy away could feel it, and she knew what happened. It was evident more than ever that the dark side, in a way, had manifested within young Solo. But Ahsoka knew that as darkness rises, a counter will rise as well. With Rey next to her, she knew it would be the continuation of the showdown between Skywalker and Palpatine, though Ahsoka feared for Luke. Ahsoka had learned through Luke what Yoda had done and how Yoda died after spending 20 years on Dagobah, suffering alone in his failure. There was a lesson that the Grand Master had in all of this, but it was a matter of being shown to Luke. Ahsoka believed that Luke needed to make his own decision on how he would handle this, if he were to continue despite his greatest failure, or if he would disappear. It was his choice. Ahsoka couldn't imagine what it was like losing a student, let alone being the master of the entire order to have lost it all. She lived through this once, she lived through one purge and she couldn't do it another time. Ahsoka continued training a 13 year old Rey, telling Rey that there would be a day when she needed to restore what was lost. It wasn't solely up to her, because there were so many good hearts in the galaxy, but she needed to make her own decisions on where she fit into all of this. Rey, having spent so much time in the Force, told Ahsoka that she wanted to find Luke. She believed that Luke could use her help. Rey told Ahsoka that if they didn't help him, then he would blame himself for losing Ben Solo. Ahsoka was always amazed by Rey's intuitive thoughts, but Ahsoka believed it was Luke's path and his decision to make as a Jedi. They couldn't be the ones that made it for him. Rey understood that to some degree, but she told Ahsoka that he needed someone by his side. She wasn't trying to convince Ahsoka to change Luke's heart, only to stand by his side, having survived one purge to be the guide for one surviving a new one. Rey knew about Order 66 because Ahsoka spoke of her past often. It was the greatest teacher because failing to learn from it allowed it to happen again, which would explain the Jedi's descent from power once again. Rey and Ahsoka would leave their current location and begin trying to find Luke Skywalker. They would find Luke on Tindilla before he left for Ahch 2, which he had erased from every star map so that he could go there undetected. When Luke turned to see Ahsoka and Rey, he could barely look at them. He could hardly tell his sister what happened, and here he was. Ahsoka looked at Luke and told him that it didn't need to be like this. A tear fell down Luke's eye as he looked at her and told her it was his fault. He saw all the signs and he allowed it to persist. Ahsoka shook her head. She told Luke that there was something greater going on here, something much deeper. Luke looked down at Rey and then back at Ahsoka, telling them that the future wasn't for the Jedi. Ahsoka shook her head, reminding Luke that while she wasn't a Jedi, what they stood for, what their imagery gave people, it was so important for the galaxy. Luke put his hand on her shoulder, telling her that the Jedi's legacy was failure. Ahsoka grabbed Luke's wrist and asked him what Yoda would say about that. Luke paused. He stood silently, looking at the floor, and then looking up with bloodshot eyes. Ahsoka told Luke to say it. He said that failure was the greatest teacher. Ahsoka nodded her head, as she caught Luke and embraced him in a tight hug. Leia was standing just a bit away as she watched her brother, and then she looked down at Rey and smiled, waving her hand over. Leia knew that Rey was a Palpatine, but she knew that to fight the descendant of the most evil man in the galaxy ever, she knew that all she needed to do was show a little bit of love. Leia asked Rey how her training was going. Rey was excited to talk about it, as she told Leia about everything she learned. Leia nodded at Ahsoka as she took Rey's hand and started walking away with her, just as Obi-Wan had done with her so many years before. Luke and Ahsoka went out on a little platform, overlooking the planet, and knelt down, and focused on the Force. Luke needed Ahsoka. She, having been so close to his father, was one of, if not the only people in the galaxy who could communicate this message to him. It's not that Leia couldn't, it was that Ahsoka understood more. She was there during the Purge, and she faced Anakin and Vader. She too also learned from Grandmaster Yoda at one point in her life, and so she could give insight that Leia wouldn't have, because she never interacted with Yoda, and never saw Anakin aside from a Force Ghost. While Ahsoka was able to keep Luke from diving off at the deep end, the larger issue was that Ben Solo was gone. There was no sight of him, and that would be the case for several years, until his return five years later. But it was with a much larger, much greater thing than himself. 
And that was the First Order, a legion of terror set in stone by Grand Admiral Thrawn, before he met his untimely defeat at the hands of Admiral Akbar. At this point, Rey was 18, and the boy who destroyed Luke's order was 28 years old. Rey was showing off skills that would have even made her grandfather proud. Luke got around to helping out with her training several months after losing his order. If it weren't for Ahsoka by his side, he would have done what every Jedi before him did, go into hiding. It was a tough hill to get over, but once he did, he began to contribute to Rey's teaching. Teaching. The truth is, while all three of them were actively hoping they would find Ben, the three of them were also contributing to Rey's development into a young Jedi. Ahsoka didn't directly make her a Jedi, but with the influence of Luke and Leia, it was easy for Rey to become a Jedi. It was at this point everything seemed fine until a group of New Republic carrier vessels were ambushed by the First Order. The carriers were moving important generator supplies from the Outer Rim to the Hosnian system, which inevitably were being placed on Ilum, where Starkiller Base was located. The the structure was about a year away from being completed, but with the resurgence, Ahsoka was letting Rey go out into the galaxy on her own to find and stop this First Order. She was being accompanied by one of her mentors. Leia was coming with her. Luke, on the other hand, was going off to try and find Ben, for the fifth time since losing him. Every year since Ben disappeared, Luke had been searching for his nephew by going out into the galaxy to try and find him, turning up empty each time he did so. He was going to do it again one last time. Leia was going with Rey because Leia foresaw the Republic's demilitarization campaign as detrimental, and with the rise of the First Order, she started a resistance, aligning the New Republic without any oversight or the required approval of the New Republic to stand up against evil. The Resistance was outfitted with a large fleet, mostly made up of retired vessels from the era of the Empire, ones that hadn't fully been taken apart yet. Though these ships were meant for an era where the largest ship they faced was an Imperial Star Destroyer, and sometimes at most, a Super Star Destroyer. Nothing would amount to what the First Order had constructed in the years leading up to this moment. Kylo Ren, as Ben Solo referred to himself now, had a master, though it wasn't Palpatine. It was the only successful Force-sensitive clone to leave the lab on Exegol, having been released mere hours before Luke killed Palpatine. The clone adapted a mind of its own, and through searching the information in the First Order database, he came to the conclusion that Solo needed to become his student, which is why during Luke's short stint away from the temple, Ben started showing more signs of the darkness. Snoke played into it, and he used it for Ben for years until he snapped. Now Ben was under his will. Leia knew that the First Order was hiding in the unknown regions, and so that's where they went. However, the issue is that when they got there, they realized how large their problem really was when they came face to face with the Supremacy. Leia ordered all the ships to retreat from the Supremacy, so they could mount up a better fighting force, and before they jumped to hyperspace, she realized someone was missing. Rey didn't want to retreat, so she jettisoned in a one-man escape pod, and it slipped into the massive Supremacy class Star Dreadnought. It didn't land in a hangar bay, but it was more so an open shaft in the bottom of the hull. Rey wasn't safe. She had the entire attention of the ship, and so she escaped into a ventilation shaft. Rey wasn't a big person either, so fitting into it wasn't that big of a task for her to do. She got in, and she sent a relay frequency out, one to inform all of her allies of where she was in case she got captured. Rey carried on throughout the Supremacy, ducking stormtroopers. At times, it was a bit difficult, considering she was in a massive ship, but she was a Jedi. So instead of cutting down her enemies, she used electric judgment on them. It was her secret weapon, one she taught herself. One that also came very naturally to her, though she used electric judgment because it wasn't meant to harm anybody, only to disarm an opponent. Ray carried on throughout the ship until she felt the presence of someone she had not faced before. It was Ben. He was so masked in the darkness that when he got close to her, he stopped in his tracks. Immediately, he whipped out his cross guard and swung at Ray. The young Jedi ignited her yellow lightsaber, and Kylo stuttered. He was shocked. He had never seen a Jedi use a yellow lightsaber before. In the days of the Old Order before Luke's was destroyed, it meant balance between knowledge and strength. To use a force and a lightsaber combat well, but to also be just as studied as much. Kylo swung forward, swinging violently at Rey. She backpedaled, blocking every strike that came her way. Ben was 10 years older than her, but there was something that Rey had to figure out. If Ben was overly cocky or not, she had been warned about it before. She felt him out, seeing how hard he was pressing, but it was evident, even without being hurt, his ego was getting a hold of him. The reason was is that 
The last time he fought a Jedi, he killed all of them, and he took the ones as he wanted as allies. He hadn't ever been beaten before in active combat. His track record of fights was undefeated in the last five years since serving Snoke. Why would he think that anyone could beat him, especially on his own turf inside of his own ship? Rey slammed down, knocking Kylo's blade against the floor as she threw her elbow out as it slammed into his mask. It really hurt, but it was jarring for the masked man. Kylo raged. His anger got to him as he threw his blade forward. Rey moved to block every strike using Form 6 to guide her movements. Kylo, on the other hand, used a combination of Forms 5, 6, and 7 to fit his aggressive style with the cross guard. Rey heard footsteps behind her. It wasn't stormtroopers, it was the Knights of Wren. She was surrounded. Rey spun under attack made by Wren, turning her attention away from him, cutting through one of the knights before parrying and cutting down another. Rey got back as she turned around and was jabbed in the shoulder by Kylo. Rey stumbled. She looked at the five individuals moving close to her. Rey spun her lightsaber around backwards, the same way her master does. Kylo pointed forward as the Knights of Ren approached first. They went in quickly, and Rey matched their speed, throwing one against the wall before being smacked in the ribs, jolting her down to one knee. The Knights spread out as Ren slammed down on her as she blocked the strike. Another Knight swung their weapon around. She fell under it as the weapon struck Kylo. Rey jabbed the Knight before being smacked across the head by another weapon, knocking her out entirely. Kylo told the knights, those still remaining, to bring her to his master. They nodded their head, and they all dragged her towards the throne room. Ren used the force to pick up Rey's lightsaber and put it on his belt. When Rey woke up, she was in a red room, on the ground. The knights were standing behind Kylo, who was on his knees. Snoke used the force and dragged Rey towards him, smiling as he did it, telling her that he just wanted to know one thing, where was the last Jedi? Snoke was obsessed with Luke Skywalker because according to Imperial databanks, it was Luke who crippled the Empire twice, and then the Alliance sprung up and took the Empire down. Snoke lifted her up into the air and began to probe her mind. As he did, the doors flew open as Kylo turned around to see Luke Skywalker. Snoke dropped Rey as he smiled, telling Kylo to finish what he started. Kylo Ren and his knights turned around and immediately ran towards Luke. The Jedi Master ignited his lightsaber and moved in. These may have been his best students, but the only one of them was even a challenge to him was Ben. Luke wasn't there to kill Ben. He was there to make things right, but if he had to, then he would. Rey looked up, watching as Kylo got thrown from his feet, and when he landed, her lightsaber popped out of his belt. Rey grinned, using the force and pulling it to her hand as she ignited it and turned towards Snoke. The evil force user grinned, lifting his finger and blasting lightning at Rey as she blocked it and threw it at one of Snoke's guards, ripping his armor apart and killing him instantly. Snoke lowered another finger and the entire group of guards moved in for the kill. Rey stepped back, preparing to stop them. Just behind her, Luke cut down two of the knights before using the force to throw another one of them into an electrical shaft, killing them immediately. Luke spun forward, using the force to throw Kylo from his feet. Rey stepped back as Luke told her that he had her back. She smiled as the two of them lined their backs up against each other, both of them using each other to defend themselves, blocking and pushing the guards back. Rey kicked one of the guards off of his feet, and she moved forward. Luke saw his opportunity, throwing his blade around forward, catching one of the weapons of the guards before telling Rey to dock. As she did, he spun around, whipping the blade towards Snoke. The blade flipped out of the lightsaber as it got close to Supreme Leader Snoke. Kylo ran and jumped in front of it. Snoke just laughed as he got to his feet, looking down at the fool who sacrificed his life for him. Luke cried out as Rey pushed Luke over before he got hit by a guard. Rey was sliced across the elbow as she recoiled, dropping her lightsaber. She turned around and caught a blade's grip in her hand, using her one uninjured arm to keep the blade away from killing her. Luke used the force and ignited his lightsaber and her lightsaber as he swung them into the guards, cutting them down, moving with incredible speed. He called out Rey, throwing her blade to her as she caught it and swung up with the little strength she had left in her arm, cutting down the guard. Rey and Luke stood side by side, looking at Snoke, who stood before them. Kylo was dead on the ground next to him. The dark side user grinned as he shot lightning at the two of them. Before the Jedi blocked the lightning, Snoke continued pressing harder as the pure force illuminated the room. Rey moved to the side, spreading out Snoke's focus. As she did, she raised her hands and shot Force Judgment at Snoke. He took the hit, losing focus on shooting lightning, and as he did, she leapt forward, swinging her blade down, cutting across his hands, cutting both of them off before swinging back and cutting his body into two pieces. Luke looked at her as she sheathed her weapon and fell over. Luke ran up to her, grabbing her in his arms, making sure she was okay. She nodded her head. She was in excruciating pain. Luke placed his hand on her stomach and transferred a little bit of Force Essence over into her. Not a lot, but just enough to heal broken ribs and the cut elbow. Rey perked up. She expressed that she didn't feel so bad anymore. Luke smiled at her as he helped her up. 
The two of them made their way for the bridge. When they got there, the New Republic arrived. It was a combined fleet, ready to take down the First Order. Luke and Rey forced the deckhands from the bridge and used the weapon systems to fire on the First Order destroyers from the Supremacy. Rey got into the computer and took all the information she could gather as the two of them abandoned ship. Within the coming weeks, they would locate and put an end to Starkiller Base, on the former Jedi world of Ilum. This has saved trillions of lives in the Hazian system, and with a victory over the First Order, finally bringing justice to the galaxy. Luke would tell Rey that it was her turn, as he passed the mantle to her, telling her that the Jedi Order was now hers. The journey for Rey would begin to establish her own Jedi Order, and with the love and compassion of the Skywalkers, she was accepted and considered as one of their own. Rey would go on in the coming years, after learning as much as she could to learn about the Force and the Jedi, to start a new Jedi Order, and a galaxy without the oppression of the forces of evil. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Boy, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Vodobo, Ball, Apollo, Mad Maddie Stews, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Flynn Van Seas, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Hit 2,000 likes on this video. Let's talk about it. All right, all right, guys. I know, I know, not everyone likes the sequels, and I get that. I'm not, I'm not saying you gotta like the sequels, but um, I, I really want to make an accepting community here for everybody, no matter what you like. We're all Star Wars fans, so bear with me with this. I know not everyone likes the sequels, but I happen to be one of the people that do like the sequels. Um, I'm not gonna lie. Last Jedi is one of my my favorite movies, one of my favorite Star Wars movies, my third favorite. Um, but this isn't about that. This isn't about sequels. We're telling stories here, right? This isn't about Disney. This isn't about Lucasfilm. We're telling stories here. And that's the point of this channel. We're telling stories. We're bringing the fandom together because we want to tell stories together. We want to enjoy stories together. That's what Star Wars has always been about. At least to me, that's what Star Wars has always been about. C-3PO telling that story to the Ewoks. Star Wars in of itself is a story for itself. So without saying anything else like broad, broader than that like this is a story for everyone prequel fans original fans sequel fans this is for all of you this is a star wars story and so there might be a spoiler warning in this video i don't really know i i'm just kind of like playing around with theories here again this is a what if i don't I don't know what's going to happen in the Ahsoka show. Obviously, I don't work at Lucasfilm, so I don't know what's going to happen. If I predicted it, I'm sorry for spoiling the show. Um, so that's my apology. If I if I predicted it, you know, five months before it comes out, hey, you heard it here first, at least, you know? All jokes aside, though, uh, this, this, this story is fun because I got to play with these characters that I don't get to play with a, a lot. You know, I always play with Anakin and Luke and Leia, and this time I got to take the mantle and pass it to those characters that are, that for in 20 years, the generation that grew up on the sequels, they're all going to love. Just like how all us prequel kids love Hayden and, and Ewan and Natalie. It's going to be that same thing for them. And so um, this was this was great for me. I like Like, for me as a writer, it was great to just, like, I couldn't stop writing, you know what I mean? And that's why it's so long. But taking all the elements of canon, literally all these elements that I've taken here are all from canon. You know, Palpatine's death actually being resurrection, uh, resurrected. Uh, Dathan and, and, and Mimar, or basically Dathan, who is the, uh, the, the, the non-Force-sensitive son of, of Palpatine, who is a clone. All that stuff is canon. I'm just taking stuff from canon and I'm like taking it and I'm restructuring the same way I do with the prequels. You know, a lot of the ideas here are, are literally just in the established canon. It's just it's just written between the lines or like hidden to that or in the subtext of an actual story, whether it be Force Awakens, Last Jedi or, or La Rise of Skywalker. And I wanted to take those, those elements and make a story out of it as I typically do. And including Ahsoka in that story, I tried to set up different inference points where you might be like, oh, that's where the canon line comes from. You know, for the canon line, it could be Ahsoka doesn't react to the vision, for example. She doesn't react to the vision of the Hosnian system. She's like, it's not in my control. It's not, not, not my thing. Or, for example, Ahsoka reacting to Luke after after the events of, of pre The Force Awakens, you know, um, which would be, I think it's 28 ABY. After those events, you know, Ahsoka getting involved. Instead of Ahsoka, you know, not getting involved, it's, you know, Luke goes in exile. And so those little instances and those moments of change right there is, is where I'm saying, you know, this is where the canon timeline could have been. You know, it could have been here. Again, I don't know if Thrawn has anything to do with First Order or Imperial Remnant, but I was kind of putting that in because I was like, eh, it sounds kind of cool, you know, put Thrawn in there for the mastermind of the First Order. And then he dies because there's only one other person in the galaxy that could tactically outdo him, being maybe Admiral Akbar, for, for example. And so that, that like this, this story was so much fun because I got to take all these 
elements that we never explore, literally never explore, and put them into the story. Like I'm, I'm like smiling because I'm so excited right now because this was so much fun. I really hope you guys like this story because like I put so much into this. Like I really want you guys to enjoy this. Like Ochi, for example, Ochi, that dude literally fought Mace Windu and, and Deborah Balaba. I'm like 90. For, it's on Wikipedia. All right, it's on Wikipedia. But like <laughs> he fought them. Like th that's so cool. You know, the dude, dude's been around for a while. You know, and so. Like, I know there's Ex Machinas in, in, in Rise of Skywalker especially, but, like, like using the Sith, the Sith Wife Finder, the, the Sith Dagger, all those things, like, using them, and then kind of subverting expectations, which I know we all love that phrase, subverting expectations with the Palpatine death, and you're like, oh, the story's over there, and it's like, no, there's actually 20 more minutes. And that, again, is so much fun for, for me to do as a, as a writer in this in this scenario, because I get to create this, this story that you kind of don't know where it's going to go, because, again, we don't talk about sequels a lot here. On the, when we do prequel stuff, I'm, I see a lot of people in the, in the, in the comments of, during the videos going on, it's like, oh, I bet this is going to happen, or I bet this is going to happen. It's like, this is a scenario where I don't know if you can really bet what's going on because we don't explore it that much. And like having Ezra talk to Luke, I thought that was like, that'd be really cool. I'm sure Ezra does talk to Luke at some point in canon, you know? Um, ben Solo being corrupted, Ben Solo being a little bit twisted. And, and it's true, Ben Solo started to show these, these signs of, of darkness when Luke and Lando went to go find the Sith dagger or went to go find Ochi. Like, that's when his descent started to be or started and so again i'm just kind of continuing what's already established in canon and just putting it up here and again the major difference being is ray being trained from birth you know ray ray being a palpatine is naturally destined to be you know powerful and so you know i wanted to to set that up with like what, what happens if she's trained i'm sure she's ado adopting electric judgment um she she showed no signs of using you know force electricity or anything like that and there's 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 several parallels throughout this st the story again i've made parallels to to the force awakens i made parallels to last jedi i really went hard on this to make it parallel and and do as george always likes to say it's like poetry it just rhymes you know the fight scene in the throne room very reminiscent of the fight scene in the last jedi or or even simply the ending and i know i know not everyone likes the ray skywalker thing but it's canon and as a, as a star wars content creator i i really want to push a positive message forward um about just just the content we're getting in general okay um and so taking that and kind of framing it into a way that makes it a little bit easier to swallow for for everyone um as a whole and and saying like you know with the love and compassion of the skywalkers she was accepted into them she was considered one of them and not necessarily that she takes her name but she was accepted by them and, and, and loved by them being the real family that she never had being that palpatine being her lineage isn't really a good family you know what i mean so I had fun with this. I really hope you guys enjoyed this. I know what I want. I know I just went on a tangent, and half it's probably gonna get cut out. I don't know at this point, but I, I, I really, I'm. I love Star Wars, guys. I love Star Wars. That's the thing. I love Star Wars. I just do. I love everything about it. I, I really do. There's very few things that I dislike, and that's this the truth. I really love this franchise, and this. It's no exception to this. This is this is a part of the reason why I love this franchise. And for me, it's really exciting to talk about something that I don't typically get to talk about because we don't get to talk about the sequels that often. And 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 talk about the sequels in a light that's that's positive or just in a story context where we get to just enjoy the story that's there. So, anyways, I love you all. Spread the love and always remember, my friends, may the force be with you.